everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Data Workshop. Uh, this week, a very special guest, Farah Kandaka. Farah is a second year student in information systems and design concentration at the Faculty of Information and one of the co hosts of the Toronto Data Workshop. Uh, she holds an honours bachelor's degree in science, in anthropology and human biology uh, from U of T. And since starting her master's, she became interested in research related to data-driven decision-making within organisations. She's been working closely with Professor Arik Sandorovic, uh, researching topics related to the application of machine learning within the field of process mining and exploring various methodologies for gaining insights from email driven business processes. And that's what Fari is gonna talk about. Fari is gonna talk about mining process uh, models from email data. So, so welcome Fari, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much Rohan. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, okay. And hopefully I don't have any hiccups along the way. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna get started. Okay. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your Thursday to attend this talk. Uh, thank you, Rohan, for this opportunity. And I'm really excited to uh, present on my progress on my ongoing research project on mining process models from email data under the supervision of Professor Arik Sandorovic. So let's get started. So the agenda for today includes a brief introduction into process mining process discovery and email mining, um, after which I will talk about the data set, the techniques I used on the data set and the results I achieved so far and then conclude with the um, next steps. So I was really inspired by um, the presentation that Alex Cookson gave from two weeks ago. And so I'm gonna begin my presentation with a little story just to um, give some context into how I got started on this project. <clears throat> So back in the ancient days of in-person learning during my first semester at the iSchool, another student and I were talking to Arik about BPMN, which was a modeling language we were learning in class. And in the course, we were taking paragraph descriptions of business processes and using the notations that we were learning to create models by hand. And so, during this conversation, um, Arik tells us that in his research in process mining, uh, computer programs can automatically create these business models from data. And now I can tell you that learning the modeling notations wasn't the difficult part. The difficult part was when you had to translate the business scenarios into models because modeling is useful and it shows you the process of how things are done and it gives you a bird's eye view of what's going on in your office or department. And there is a lot of going back and forth, just making sure that the tasks that can be done in parallel um, are done in parallel and the tasks um, and that like, you know, the process actually ends properly without any kind of deadlock. So there was a lot to think about um, when it comes to modeling processes and you know, here is Arik telling me that all of this could be done by computer code. And so, of course, you know, I did the obvious thing that you do in a situation where you're faced with new information and just blurted out the first thing that came to my mind, which was something along the lines of, oh, my God, your research is going to put us business analysts out of jobs. <laughs> because in my first year Master of Information Brain, all you did as business analysts were, you know, create models and <laughs> give presentations on them. And our spatial expression was exactly what you would expect when you tell someone that their research was going to put people out of business. And it was just one of shock and plain confusion. And he went on to say, no, it's going to give them more time to do more important tasks. And obviously that made more sense after he said it. But like, I was so embarrassed and I'm like, oh my God, now he thinks I'm dumb. Like I'm never gonna be able to build a report with him. And you know, that bridge is burnt. And you know, first year grad student, all the worst possible thoughts that your imposter brings you. <laughs> um, but then in the winter semester of last year, uh, he gave a presentation on his process mining research for the Toronto Data Workshop. And I became even more curious like about what this field was. And at the time I was also taking his database course. 
And so I gathered up the courage and, you know, asked him if he would be willing to supervise me for a reading course on process mining. And here we are, two reading courses in. So a big thank you to Rohan and Kelly and the Toronto Data Workshop for, you know, connecting data enthusiasts with data enthusiasts. And thank you, Arik, so much for taking me on as your research student. And so that's the story of how I got started with this project. And now we're going to move on to mining processes. So I'm going to give a very high level introduction into process mining because there is an entire course and people do their whole PhDs on this topic. So process mining is a business intelligence technique that seeks to automate the work of a modeler. And um, this technique uses data that's captured from different sources uh, to form useful models for analysis by analysts. And <clears throat> with this picture, um, with this slide, I would like to kind of put into perspective the interactions of the environment, the software systems, and the models. So, you know, we have the world, and we have people in the world and businesses that interact with software systems, and we have software systems that uh, record events and transactions and um, so store them into databases. And so process models here are often used in academia and in the industry to kind of explain how things are done in this world and envision how things can be done. And so what process mining aims to do is it aims to take this task of modeling and make it more data driven. And so there's, according to these, like similar to how these, there, the, the arrows at the bottom, there's three kinds of process mining. There's process discovery, uh, there's conformance checking and there's enhancement. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, process discovery in the next uh, few slides because that's what my research has mostly been focused on. And process mining is usually applied in areas like logistics, finance, and healthcare to pinpoint areas of improvement in a business. So to kind of bring it to a more recent event, the recent conundrum with the freight ship that was stuck at the Suez Canal was actually a great example of how fragile the existence of a bottleneck can make a system. And bottlenecks are areas of congestion in a system where um, this, the bottlenecks dictate essentially the pace of the entire operation operation. And so if a high traffic area is blocked, then the entire system comes to a standstill. And in the case of the Suez, right, like delays in shipments can cause scarcity of critical resources in certain areas. And so bottlenecks within a system are one of the many problems that can be highlighted once you um, start implementing process mining methods. And of course, you know, you can't talk about the Suez conundrum without talking about or showing some of the glorious memes that were going on that week. It was a bad week for logistics people everywhere, but a great week for us memers. <laughs> uh, so uh, moving on to process discovery. Uh, as mentioned earlier, my research project so far has largely centered around process discovery. And process discovery is, um, about discovering frequent and infrequent patterns in a process from the data that's collected by information systems. And there are specific algorithms that the data can be fed into, but um, the before that, the data must be structured to contain three key elements. The data must contain a case ID, it must contain timestamps, and it must contain um, activities. So the case ID is, um, it tells you the essentially like an instance of what, uh, it tells you an instance of the business process or it separates um, the instances of business processes. And the, uh, the, time, the timestamps are there to tell you uh, the ordering of the activities um, that occurred and the activities tell you what actually occurred in that instance of the business process. And so once the data is formatted, it can be fed into algorithms to uh, retrieve process models. And an example of an algorithm is the alpha miner. And um, different algorithms uh, return different process models based on something called the representational bias, which is essentially how the model, how the algorithm returns a process model. And in the case of the alpha miner, it can take an event log like this, which um, is basically kind of like a, um, a, claim, a, um, a claim process where you have the request being registered and it's examined. And then, you know, you check the ticket, you decide what happens. And it, like in this case, it's either rejected or in the other case, the compensation is paid. So it can take um, process models like this and it can return um, a, a model like this, which is called a PetriNet. And you can see that the model that was, um, or the, the data that was reflected here is also reflected by the model. 
where you have, you know, register, register request, and then it can go either way. And in the end, you decide to either pay compensation or reject the request. And so like, you know, why do we want to mine processes from emails anyways? And emails are interesting because they contain a lot of organizational context and information. And they are in a way receipts of interactions that happen between people. Like, you know, we all know that Hillary Clinton's emails were front and center in the political scandal that she found herself in. So emails as a data source is not something new. And the most common um, email mining techniques include spam classification, email classification, contact analysis, and perhaps we can even add business process, extracting business processes. Um, because emails as a source for business processes have been studied since the early 2000s with the mail of mine approach being one of the first kind of end to end pipelines for mining business processes out of emails. And um, so a lot of also recent publications in both process mining and machine learning literature have also um, studied on how we can infer meaning from emails automatically. But you might also be thinking like, why would we do that, especially when we have information systems like CRMs and ERPs collecting event data anyways. So while it's true that a lot of the like work gets captured by CRM and ERP systems, um, we like these systems usually capture data that's already about structured processes, right? Like when a customer sends a complaint, you know what to do. When an inventory is low, when inventory is low, you also know what to do. There are set, set, set of tasks. But you know, what happens if you have to kind of arrange meetings with three different groups and set three different agendas and you have like two reports that are due around the same day, right? Like which one do you prioritize? And obviously that we can do for ourselves but it might take the load off of the office worker if we can have um, systems that analyze and kind of help us break down these tasks and prioritize certain things for us. And so the idea with this research is to analyze emails to understand the behavior of how work is done. And then this kind of research can then be leveraged to perhaps help the office worker manage their productivity through like task managers or something like that. Um, yeah. So. Now, if we try to combine process mining with email mining, um, there is a challenge because as, men as I mentioned before, you need structured data. The data needs to be structured in a certain way with the whole case ID, timestamps, and activities. And email data is not structured. Like you, people call it semi-structured because the headers, you know, you have the from, the to, you have specific fields, but the email body is not structured at all. So before we can even mine for processes, there needs to be major text mining and data engineering done in order to get the unstructured email to this structured format. And so the rest of my talk is going to be focused around how I attempted to do that. Now, the data set that uh, on which this research has been kind of um, going on, on is the Enron um, email corpus. It's freely available on Kaggle and there is a dedicated website to it. And it contains around 500,000 observations. And this does not necessarily translate to 500,000 emails. And this, 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 this distinction is important because, um, and I will talk about this a little bit more in the next few slides. It's also um, a mixture of ham and spam emails from over 150 different Enron employees. The Enron um, Corporation was an energy corporation um, in America in the early 2000s who went bankrupt due to an accounting scandal. And so this data set was released after the federal government um, finished the investigation. And so when, when you first get this data set, it's only, it only has two columns. One is file and the other one is message. The file just indicates which, which file this email was stored in. And the message indicates uh, it, it has everything from the headers to the body, like all in one string. And so much of the data frame structuring was done during the machine learning course 2179, uh, where we took um, these 500,000 emails and we uh, attempted to get rid of all the spam emails as part of our project. And in that course, we also, um, to, make the, to make the data set more workable because you know our laptop fans were going crazy <laughs> trying to process 500,000 rows of text. We tried to um, scope it down to um, <clears throat> contain emails between the years of 2000 and 2001. And we also scoped it a bit more to only contain emails between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. 
um, because we know some people uh, start work early, some people um, end work late. And so we just wanted a good range of emails to consider while also scoping things down. But even though the email um, data set is structured now compared to before, no amount of process mining can be done on this because there really is no way to indicate which emails belong to which business processes or which emails are related to each other. Um, as you know, there's no there's no indication of case ID and there are no active there's no indication of which activities are contained in which email. And so this was the project that we tried to undertake in um, 2166, the business process management and mining course. And the group project, um, we for the group project, we, we attempted to derive both case ID and activities. Um, but due to the fact that there were nested emails and the text mining algorithms didn't exactly work the way um, we thought they would, we were unable to extract the activities, but we were able to form case IDs. And so the, the reading course that I'm currently doing right now has attempted to refine the methods for extracting activities. Um, and so for the cleaning and analysis of the email bodies, the following techniques were used. We use regular expressions, we use parts of speech tagging, limitization, um, latent sem semantic analysis, latent Dirichlet um, allocation, k-means clustering, TF-IDF, which is term frequency, inverse document frequency, and I used Python, sorry, Rohan. <laughs> um, uh, we use the Python libraries of NLTK, GenSim, and sklearn. And these uh, methodologies or these techniques are also very common um, techniques in um, these papers, but also uh, more papers um, in the in academia. Um, okay, so this is a lot of information, but I'm going to go through it. So just bear with me. So we took the original, we took the data frame that was already subsetted to, you know, contain emails between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. But we still needed to scope it down a bit more. Um, and so we, what we did was we counted the most frequent senders of emails and selected the top sender who is Vince Kaminsky. And Vince Kaminsky is a research scientist at Enron. And so because he, he was the one who sent the most emails within that data frame, um, we decided to just go with him because we thought that he would have, he would be involved in a lot of business processes given the number of emails he sent. And this left us with 2,200 emails. So then we, we ran cleaning algorithms and we you know, ran uh, parts of speech, uh, we ran limitization and stemming and we um, did k-means and tf-idf with the intention that some keywords would be revealed that would, uh, sh that would tell us the kinds of um, processes or the kinds of emails that Vince was sending. But because the text um, data of emails is so um, kind of is unstructured or for at that point, we didn't know exactly why our um, results were, were returning like very gibberish type of um, answers. So what we did was uh, knowing that Vince is a research scientist and knowing that um, research scientists schedule a lot of meetings, we made the assumption that we're pretty sure that Vince schedules a lot of meetings. And so these um, list of keywords were then used to naively match emails related to scheduling. So uh, if the email contained three or more of these words, um, then we labeled them as scheduling emails and the rest were discarded. If they were not scheduling emails, the emails were discarded. And so this left us with 840 emails. And then um, peop we only kept the emails uh, that the, like, where Vince communicated with the person four or more times. And the assumption was that a proper email con conversation would le last at least four emails, especially if it was about a business process. And so only considering emails with four or more, um, only considering like the emails that contained four or more um, interactions back and forth, this left us with around 600 emails. And then because we knew Vince was the only sender, we used that 600 emails and we matched, uh, we considered the those emails that contain the same subject line to be part of one email thread. And so if the, th if the subject lines matched uh, after removing the replies and forwarded prefixes, if the subject lines matched, then we considered them as part of the thread ID. And then threads that contain less than two emails were discarded and this left us with 250 emails. And so at the end, we had a data frame like this where 
based on, because the sender was the same, it was all Vince, based on the um, subject line, if, they were, if the subject lines were the same, then they were part of the same um, thread. And now came the problem of deriving activities. So the problem of deriving, deriving activities have also been um, tackled by researchers and researchers in academia, uh, but we were facing three major obstacles. Uh, firstly, the researchers often worked with data sets where one email related to one activity. And this was not the case for us because one email contained multiple activities. Um, the emails were pretty long. And researchers also worked with data sets where one row contained one email. And this was also not the case for us, which is why in the beginning um, I mentioned that just because there were 500,000 rows didn't necessarily mean there were 500,000 emails. And the researchers also hired annotators to label activities in emails. And we did not have the time or resources to do that. Um, so I want to expand a bit more on what I mean by one row contains one email. So if we look at the fourth row, um, index three, the email that, that, that this contains, we see that the email content um, has FYI at, as like the, uh, as the initial start and FYI, uh, initial um, kind of word. And FYI, you know, ref usually refers to, just want to share some information with you, right? And so when you, Kind of peer into that email, right? It's it's a a monster of three different emails um, combined because that makes sense. FYI means I'm sharing some information with you, but if I were to run normal text mining algorithms, right? Even after I clean out all the slashes, after I clean out all the numbers, if I were to run um, TFIDF and K-means on this email. I would not know that this was an email about information sharing, like FYI, right? And so that's what makes text mining and email mining like so different. And there's a huge, like this is what makes it so big, the difference that like in text mining and a lot of the tutorials that you go through, you know, they'll use like the tutorials will use methods like TFIDF or LSA on text that has some sort of uniformity, like in terms of vocabulary or length. Normal, like normally the, the text is either, you know, like a, a newsletter, a, a news corpus or journal articles. And so generally the length of the news articles and the length, length of like um, journal articles are the same and they contain like similar words if they're about similar topics, but that's not the case for emails because emails can be super, uh, super, um, super detailed. Like if I were to share a meeting agenda or it can be like super sparse. Like if I was like, okay, see you at four, right? So because of this lack of uniformity, both in terms of um, kind of length and vocabulary, it's like standard NLP methods um, return really weird results. And I'm just going to dive into one example. My third point here is uh, lower casing and stop word removal is good for general text mining, but bad for business process mining. Um, and the example that I want to talk about is this column here called email verbs. So for our um, business process mining project, the, cor the course project, we after we uh, derived the case IDs, we tried to derive um, activities based on the verbs because you know, activities are based on actions and actions are denot denoted by verbs. So that was the logic that we were following. Um, so after, after running, uh, like after standardized normalizing the text by lower casing and like removing the punctuations and everything, we ran the um, NLTK libraries parts of speech tagger, and the results like kind of baffled us because proper nouns like Steve and Vince and like Joseph were categorized as verbs, and we like our data was already very noisy, and this inclusion of you know tags that we didn't want to just made it worse. And so um, lower casing is a, like I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say all the text mining kind of um, tutorials that I came across have recommended, you know, lower casing before starting any text mining kind of um, process. But lower casing here actually mislabeled proper nouns as verbs. But when I didn't um, lower case, from, initially the parts of speech tagger was much more smarter or it, it, the, the accuracy was much higher. Um, and so that's why, uh, you know, 
this meme just makes or this this tweet is just like the most accurate thing that I've seen where you know in tutorials you get these really beautiful results and the outputs all make sense and then you run it on your data set and it's just the results don't make sense and you wonder why and you did exactly what the tutorial said but it just you end up more confused um so but we still had to you know find a way to derive these activities so on the mission to derive activities what we aim to do was try something new so we had we tried to get rid of the problem of nested emails by splitting and slicing the string and this was done per email body so each email was split by the sent field um, like the sent field as part of the email header it was split by that to capture the timestamp and email signatures were removed and the we decided to subset on just one part of the um, on one subset of the scheduling emails to test out um, how accurate this new kind of cleaning or um, new kind of method was going to be. And so thread 10, we, we subsetted the, the data frame to only be to only consider emails from thread 10. And after splitting the emails based on the sent um, field, the thread the thread 10 usually um, like originally it contained 10 emails but after the splitting it expanded to like 62 and there were a lot of repetitions but um the it just shows how many emails were nested in between it, within those 10 emails and rows that didn't have timestamps were cross-referenced with the original data set so what i mean is we took the email content of only thread 10. Okay, we ignore, we didn't look at the data, the, the timestamps that were already given in the data set. We just looked at the email content and based on the sent, the sent fields that were that are like spark, dispersed within this um, within this uh, block of email, we split based on the sent field and we got timestamps, right? So um, based on these timestamps from the bodies after the email signatures were cleaned out. Uh, we also cleaned out the, we also removed, um, we, we uh, took timestamps and we spliced it individually. So we had to look out for things like Tuesday being shorter than Thursday and considering these individual characteristics because it was string splicing and the dates were not uniform. Um, after that, we, um, after the splicing and after running the, the, the string timestamps through like a date time library in Python, we finally got a data set where, you know, the body is singular emails, um, like here, the timestamps are timestamp objects. And based on these singular email um, body, we extracted features like limitized verbs and um, like nouns and verbs without the prepositions or numbers or anything like that. So a, a much cleaner representation of the original email. And so this word cloud image that I'm showing on the left side is the email is the um, like the collection of words that were that were that were that were contained within thread ten before the splitting. So all the normal cleaning um, methods were done, but this is the collection of words before the splitting of the email was done. So you can see things like CC and you know original message. Whoa, right? Like so, there's a lot of words um, that are like nonsensical and don't really add a lot of value. Whereas afterwards, um, after the cleaning, you, you see more words of more value, right? More like seminar, like date, a, a campus, presentation, um, things like that. And so now what, now in, again, we're on, still on the mission to derive activities, right? So we're gonna focus on the lemma verbs and we need to um, format the data in a way where we have the case ID and an activity. And so what I did was I took these words, um, these verbs, and essentially I, I separated them into a data frame that only contains the verbs. So something like this, right? Um, the data frame is 23 columns wide because the longest list contained 23 verbs. But this is a rep this is a rep representation of each email in terms of verbs. And now, in order for me to run it through um, the process mining um, application that I was using, um, I needed to format this data to be long and not wide. And of course, pandas always gives me a headache with this. But this is where tidyverse comes in handy all the time. Data frame manipulation, like tidyverse, is the best. And so I pivot long this table. And it gives me 
you know, like something similar to like a case ID and um, the activities um, that are that are that can be seen, you know, similar to the picture on the right hand side. And so I take this um, data, I take this data frame, I convert it to a CSV file, and I upload it onto Prom, which is the process mining application that um, takes your that takes your event log and essentially outputs a uh, process model based on the algorithm you choose. And so I decided to go with the alpha miner um, because it's one of the original process mining algorithms. And um, this is what I get. And so, uh, yes, so in terms of discovering business processes, this is not um, useful at all. And um, what you would call this a spaghetti map of sorts. Um, but, but if we do look at it a bit closely, you can see that because of the way the alpha miner works, it looks at the um, activities that frequently directly follow one another. And so you'll see that words like will is um, essentially followed frequently by the words like see or check or work. So like, I will see, I will check, I will work. Even though this doesn't tell me much about the business process itself, it tells me, it gives me a bit more insight into the kind of vocabulary that is used um, when applying or vocabulary that's used in this case, um, when um, business emails are uh, scheduled essentially. And so um, now, uh, so we'll, there's still a lot more work to do, but this was really cool to see. <laughs> um, so now when it comes to the limitations and challenges, um, I have to tell you that before starting work on this project, I have always, always tried to avoid text and string data because it is not easy to make the computer do what you want on text data. And e like since starting and even now, like I really struggle with understanding, okay, like how much manual labor do I need to put into this? Is there some function that I'm not thinking of right now that would make my life easier? Like with numerical data, right? If your data doesn't look a certain way, you can do like logarithmic transform transformation or like two key transformation, like box cox and make it look the way that you want. And these transformations can usually be applied to like the entire data frame or the entire column itself, right? But that's not the case at all for text data. Like something as simple as, you know, like an email from the same data set can have something like the sent field for timestamps and another email can have something like the date field for timestamps. And then the order in which the headers appear also change. And these things are like, you know, minor maybe, but they're pretty annoying when, you're, when you are only left with having to splice strings to get your data. And there's so many different kinds of regular expressions that you have to use because each email client, um, like it structures their email, like the email signature is structured in a different way. Some use like backslashes, some use front slashes, some use tilde hyphen. So you have to think of a regular expression for like different email signatures, a different one for like email banners that say forwarded email, you know, a different one for web links. And the other like main issue that I faced with this data set was that there's no data owner. There's no one that I can hold accountable for, for inaccurate data. And so I'm just gonna give you one example of what I mean. As I mentioned before, right, some emails didn't have the sent field. And so I had to go and I had to reference the original data set to see if I can find the data, uh, to, to see if I can find the timestamp. Um, and so when I'm looking at this email um, timestamp, it shows that this person got uh, received this email at 814 AM. And immediately when I saw it, I knew it didn't make any sense because the original in the original data set, the first email that was sent in this thread was sent at 10.59 a.m. So there's no way a person could receive the email at 8.14 if it was sent at 10.59. But because you know I had like I had worked with this data set for a long time. <laughs> I knew that the, the Enron headquarters were based in Houston, and the person being emailed lived in Berkeley, California. Um, and Houston and Berkeley have a two hour time difference. So that totally made sense after, you know, it's not like it came to me right away. Like I, I had to think about this a lot, but what still didn't make sense was the fact that it was 814 when he received it, but it was 1059 when um, Vince sent the email. And so what I did was I you know, went back to the original data set to try and find 
the actual timestamp. And that was also different. That was 450. And like, so I'm, I'm having to deal with three different dates for this one email. So, you know, I decided not to like, you know, dig the hole any further. I just went with the timestamp that made the most sense to me, which was the 11.55 a.m. one. But this was just one example of the many kinds of decisions that I had to make on this data set because there is no um, owner. And so um, I don't know how like me inserting these kinds of biases or like decisions into this data set is going to affect the process processing long run or like what's going to happen down the road but I also don't know a way around it. Uh, yes, okay. And so future work. Um, my future work would be to uh, like essentially think, like read about methods about abstracting meaning from phrases, right? Like, uh, and, and um, to build on that, I've been looking more into kind of word embeddings to find similarities between words and phrases because I can send an email to Rohan and say, okay, let's shoot for a meeting at, you know, uh, what, 4.55 p.m., right? But the word shoot, right, if you think of, like, if you take it, like, explicitly, that doesn't have any meaning to a scheduling email. So I'm trying to read more about what's been done in literature to see how we can abstract these kinds of meanings from um, the words so that we can um, look at the business process and the words from a higher level. And also verbs, um, don't contain a lot of context. So I'm going to focus more on the verb noun pair biograms in terms of activities. And another thing that I will look more into is like processing emails with different lengths in different ways, because an FYI email doesn't need all that like regex and all that um, like punctuation removal as you know an email that's mostly about um, like sharing information about an, an email agenda, for example or how to separate those two. So that's that's left to future work. Um, so in conclusion, uh, process mining can be very useful for many business contexts and it provides a data-driven understanding of organizational processes and email is text, but text requires more, pro but email text <laughs> requires more processing and formatting for analysis compared to standard text. And really like reading courses are the iSchool's greatest secret. Like they are amazing. Please take advantage of them. They are so rewarding. And that is it for my presentation. Thank you all for listening and listening to my presentation and progress, but also the scattered ranting that was there in between. Cause you know, as uh, Rohan says so eloquently that therapy is expensive, but the Toronto Data Workshop is free. So thank you again. And I'll be happy to take any questions or feedback or commentary really. <laughs> Thank you very much, Faria. That was just incredible. I'll stop.